Ivory Coast. The mass pardon comes one week after 46 of the Ivorian soldiers were sentenced to 20 years in prison. Three other defendants, all women, were released in September but tried in absentia where ha had been arrested or sentenced to a dead. Stay with us. This is Views on the Continent. Hello and thanks for joining us this day on your Pan-African television. This is Afrique Media. We appreciate you for always uh, staying with us and thanks for joining us today on the program. We're using the continent as we're taking a look at uh, diplomacy regarding uh, relations between Mali and the Ivory Coast. We're talking about the 49, uh, 46 or 49 rather, uh, mercenaries of Ivorian nationalities who were pardoned recently by uh, Mali's uh, President Colonel Simi Goita, the 46 who were detained since July in Mali, were recently uh, granted uh, amnesty by uh, Mali's uh, Asimi Goita. And this, of course, uh, is what we discuss on this day on the, the program. Uh, the uh, pardon comes one week after the 46 uh, who were charged with conspiracy and undermining the countries of Mali's uh, security. Uh, were charged or sentenced to 20 years in prison. Uh, two or three of them who were women uh, uh, were equally sentenced in absentia to life or to death. And this is uh, the situation we're looking at, the relations between Mali and Ivory Coast following the uh, pardon of uh, the 46 uh, uh, missionaries, which of course is what we discussed in this on the program. Thanks for joining us again. Uh, we we discussing this topic with I guess on the other side on Zoom, he is uh, Mr. Elijah Inoku, a researcher with Lakes University on African Development. Mr. Elijah, we appreciate your time. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us on the program this day. Six Ivorians were convicted on an attack and conspiracy against the government and uh, of seeking to undermine state security. Public prosecutor Laji Sara said in the statement at the time the trial opened in the capital Bamako on December 9, 29, rather, and closed on the, the following day. And just to note that the 46 were charged with uh, sentence to 20 years imprisonment and three other defendants or women who were released in September, uh, Bert tried in absentia, had been sentenced to death. Mr. Elijah Nwoku, uh, what's your appreciation regarding uh, this decision, uh, pardoning 46 of those uh, considered mercenaries uh, by uh, President Colonel Simi Goita? How did you welcome this uh, decision? having a little difficulty in uh, connecting with Mr. Elijah Noko. We hope to re-establish connections uh, with you just very shortly. Just a reminder that we shall equally be uh, joined by Mr. Kane Presley. He is an international relations uh, uh, expert. He will join us equally by Zoom to discuss on the uh, decision. Mali is President Colonel Simi Goita granting pardon to 49 uh, soldiers from neighboring Ivory Coast who were arrested in July and accused of being uh, mercenaries. And uh, this decision, according to uh, Mali's uh, spokesperson, uh, Colonel Abdullah Maiga, he said uh, in a statement, the pardon granted by Mali's president, Colonel Simi Goita, uh, 
is of course demonstrates once again his commitment to peace dialogue pan-africanism and the preservation of fraternal uh, secular relations with uh, regional countries in particular those between mali and ivory coast of course the soldiers arrests and charges had sparked diplomatic uh, disputes between mali and ivory coast there were equally pressures from uh, echo was calling on the release of the soldiers it should be equally noted that uh, after the ivorian uh, soldiers were arrested the united nation admitted to some uh, procedural uh, dysfunction in a note addressed to uh, the malian government and said that certain measures have not been or were not followed at the time and equally uh, the ivorian president on his part alasan watra had equally acknowledged in september shortcomings and uh, misunderstandings regarding the arrival of uh, its soldiers in Mali. The statement also denounced uh, the aggressive position of ECOWAS uh, leader Umaru Siseko Ayambalu. We're looking at uh, the impact of the release of these 49 missionaries of Ivorian nationality uh, following a pardon by President of uh, Mali, Colonel Asini Goita. We Equally, we are appreciating, uh, we appreciate your comments and your opinions. You shall leave them on our Facebook page. The program is being streamed live on Facebook. We shall be pleased to hear from you. Leave us your comments. And let's try to re-establish re connections with you, Mr. Elijah Inoku. Uh, can you get the feedback from here? Yes, I can hear you five and five. I don't know why you can't hear me. All right, Mr. Elijah, uh, we were, uh, you were talking about the uh, appraisal on the uh, release of these 49 soldiers from neighboring Mali and the pardon granted by Asini Goita. Yeah, can you hear me now, Luis? Yes, we can get the feedback properly. Yeah, what I was saying is that this is a welcome information. Peace is always welcome in the continent of Africa. What we want in Africa is peace. But like I said from the beginning, the devil is always in the details. What went in into this negotiation is what, you know, you and I should be concerned about. All Africans should be concerned about. But again, from the surface, peace is always a welcome initiative. All of Africa, we cannot develop Africa without peace. We need peace on the continent. We need peace inside the countries. We need peace between countries. We need peace in the whole of Africa. The whole slogan of gun blazing to be seized by 2020 has all been failing. So we need peace. And on that surface, I will welcome it as good news for the whole sub-region of West Africa. But let's go into the details because, like I said, the devil is in the details. It took a lot of negotiation from the Cong uh, Togolese uh, president to bring these two sides into together. But first and foremost, let's take a step back because sometimes... Um, people, you know, we do have short memories because, you know, we're so busy and people forget about what has transpired here. The United Nations that Ivory Coast claimed that they were sending their forces in, <clears throat> in obedience to a, a request from the United Nations. The United Nations came out and said there was some misunderstanding. They did not request for any um, Ivorian uh, missionaries. And Ivorian was, Ivory Coast was claiming that these were coming from, you know, as a request from the United Nations for more forces to stabilize Mali. So we see here that it was clear that these were not United Nations forces. These were not something that was requested by the United Nations. We see, you know, everybody, the handwriting is on the wall, is pointing to some French orchestrated machinery from Ivory Coast to destabilize that region. That's what is clear. That's what the handwriting on the wall is. We all know that. Now, <clears throat> secondly, what went into this negotiation is what should concern every one of us. We know Asimi Goiter has acted in good faith to release these Ivorians. He wants peace in that subregion. He wants, you know, a cordial relationship with his neighbors. But is that the same thing we're getting from Watara? Let's take a step back. Because the honest truth is that the bad boy of West Africa is Alassane Drama Watara. This is the person that has allowed the whole region to be stabilized because of the influence of France in that region through Alassane Draman Ouattara. And again, can we trust Alassane Draman Ouattara? Because there are negotiations and there are courts that went into that decision for those soldiers to be released. The question is, is Alassane Draman Ouattara trustworthy to sign an accord? 
the handwriting is the word. And everybody that analyzes the situation in that region will come to the conclusion that Alassane Drama Watara is not trustworthy. If you look at every accord that Alassane Drama Watara has signed, right from the Lome Accord, when he was supporting the rebels in the north, they went into accord with Bagabo in order to maintain peace. What happened? That accord was never respected. When the IMF was looking for somebody to devalue the French CFA, they went to Nigeria, the Nigeria envoy rejected it. They went to Semak region, the Semak region rejected it. They went to many regions within the sub-Saharan African region. None of them accepted to, to, to take on that task. Alassan Drama Watara was still with the IMF at that time. He was the person that took on that task and devalued the French CFA. So again, I'm giving this trend line for us to see the behavior of this leader, to see that his actions are not trustworthy within the ECOWAS sub-region. Not only that, when, the, 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 when he came to power, remember, he said it is unconstitutional for African leaders to stick to power and want to maintain themselves in power. And he said he was going to rule for two terms. After what happened, this man changed the constitution and is ruling now for the third term. Not only that, when the ECO money that ECO was agreed on, that they were going to have a single monetar uh, monetary policy and come out with a single uh, money so that they can kick out the French CFA, who went behind to destroy that agreement? Through the influence of France, it is still Alassane Draman Ouattara. So I am giving this analysis to show the world, especially Africans, to understand that they are leaders that can be trusted in Africa and they are leaders that cannot be trusted in Africa. Alassane Draman Ouattara has shown that he's one of those leaders in the sub-regional context of Africa that cannot be trusted when it comes to agreements. So again, Asimi Goita has done this in good faith. I will assume that he wants to maintain peace within the sub-regional uh, region of ECOWAS. He wants to have uh, friendly neighborliness with his neighbors. He wants to have peace in that sub-region, but he is dealing with somebody that has consistently shown that when it comes to respecting the terms of an agreement on a court, he's not trustworthy. So again, let's take this peace at face value and say it's a good thing. These soldiers have been released. There's going to be peace in that sub-region, but I'm a malish watch out because again, Alassane Drama Watara is not a trustworthy leader within the sub-regional area of ECOWAS. And we've seen France, we've seen France particularly, come in, manipulate their way through that same leader to have a stay in that region. Because what is happening in the sub in, in sub-Saharan region, especially in France and Africa, is that people are tired of puppet leaders. People are tired of leaders that are going to be risk. You know, answerable to the West instead of answerable to their own people. Again, as I said on this platform some time ago, Africans are not yearning for junta to rule them. Africa are not in law with junta to rule them. But Africa are tired of puppet leaders who will be there to represent the interests of some Western powers. That is why they say we don't care whether it's a military leader. We don't care as long as this person represents our interests. We want them there. So the best or the West or whoever better listen that Africans are tired and they do not want any more leaders that are going to represent the interests of the West. So what Asimi Guita has done is a commendable F, uh, initiative and all Africans should welcome peace on the, on the whole of African continent, conflict resolution. Again, it teaches us that Africans can also solve their own problems. But as I said from the beginning, Mr. Lewis, let's watch out. Because Ivory Coast, under the leadership of Alassane Drama Ouattara, is not trustworthy on the African continent as we speak. He's acted as a bad boy of Africa, representing foreign interest. That is where the problem is so far. Just like you've said, uh, we now understand the troubled rule of um, President of Ivory Coast, Alassane Drama Ouattara, regarding uh, the interests of France, which he is protecting uh, in the continent. And we understand equally, Mr. Elijah, that France at the moment is desperate considering uh, the uh, fact that relationship between 
uh, France and Mali has deteriorated, that in Central Africa has equally deteriorated. And the fact that uh, France is now using uh, Alassane Ouattara, or definitely using uh, soldiers in Ivory Coast, the first attempt has failed. Now, what else should we be expecting considering the desperate nature of France and its interest in trying to regain back the territories which it is losing? Let me, let me say something that a French diplomat once said. He said in French, in un accord s'engage, c'est lui qui croit. That's to say, every accord is only relevant to somebody that believes in it. That is the French policy. And we see, like you mentioned, that the waning interest of French capitulation in Africa, the fact, the effect of that is so weighing on the French in such a way that they will do anything anywhere to want to maintain their presence in Africa. We see what is happening in Central African Republic. For those who are following the, the development over there, we see how there's bombardment going on. They are trying to win back influence in that region through the battle of the gun. And Africans should be very careful because these people are not out for our own interests. They are trying to win influence because they see the, you know, the deteriorating effect, I mean, the impact of France the whole of uh, Western African region, we see that they are trying to maintain themselves in Chad. We see that they are trying to maintain themselves in, a, you know, Guinea, in Guinea. We see that they are trying to manipulate their situation in a, a Equatorial Guinea, but they didn't succeed. So France is not giving up. It is for the Africans to be on the watch. France is not giving up any time soon. Now, Africans are bringing in Russia. I said on this platform and many other platforms that Africans do not have, should not have a preference for anybody because if we are not careful, we can rob Peter and pay Paul. Africans should welcome every person that comes to the table and become a kingmaker. If somebody is coming to the table for a negotiation and partnership, we look at them as equal partners because France, as I said before, is not an enemy of Africa, but their policies. The policies on the continent of Africa is what Africans hate and they will fight any day, any time. But if France changes its policy and they want to deal with Africans as partners, equal partners, not as colonial masters and the ones being colonized, because that is not going to happen anytime anymore in the continent of Africa, because the direction that we see Africans going as a direction of you know, emancipation to take the continent on their own terms, to negotiate on their own terms. So if France comes to the table with good hands, they say he who comes with equity must come with clean hands. If France is coming to the table with clean hands, Africans will welcome them. If Russia is coming to the table with clean hands, Africans will welcome them. If the United States or the EU is coming to the table with clean hands, Africans will welcome them and work as partners. Transfer of technology, whatever it is, Africans will welcome them. But if France wants to continue the manipulation that we are seeing because, you know, the deterioration effect, I mean, uh, impact of uh, France Africa, and they feel that they can still maintain their status on those bases, France will be making a very, very big mistake. Africans are already on the watch, and they know where the problem is. And I'm also sending a message to Ivorians who can understand English, because I know they speak French, that your leader is not doing any good. If Ivory Coast becomes the poster child of Africa, the poster child of France Africa, where the rest of Africa is trying to emancipate itself and come out from, come out from this neocolonialism, and we have a stooge, we have a puppet leader, still hanging on to France Africa in order to implement French neocolonial mentality and principles in Africa, Ivory Coast will be left behind because this train is not stopping anytime soon. Africans are tired of this kind of leadership and they want to move past it. So again, Ivorians should be on the watch because this is not sustainable. When people are tired of a kind of dictatorship or mean a, a kind of leadership and you want to hang on to it, you will be left on the sideline because Africans are marching forward. that as well and despite the fact that the united nation accepted that the soldiers uh, arrested in mali were not linked to its peacekeeping mission and equally what are equally accepting that they were lapses in uh, the uh, the way or, or how the soldiers arrived in mali 
despite all that, we still saw pressure from uh, ECOWAS, which the uh, Abdullahi Maiga in their statement equally acknowledged or said that uh, we denounced the position of ECOWAS and denounced the pressure uh, that was coming from ECOWAS. What do we all make of this pressure from ECOWAS, considering that uh, both parties involved, United Nations and Ivory Coast, accepted that uh, the, something was wrong somewhere, but we still saw pressure from ECOWAS. Now, what does this mean to the leadership of ECOWAS, which we know is uh, uh, Umaru, Siseko, and Balo, and equally the, you know, the independent nature of ECOWAS regarding its position it has to play with vis-a-vis uh, -vis being uh, the political and economic power of the, the region? Mr. Lewis, what is ECOWAS? ECOWAS is a two-third bull bulldog being manipulated by France as we speak. I mentioned to you, when the ECOWAS came out with the ECO money and they wanted to implement it, who destroyed it? The same Alassane Draman Ouattara destroyed ECOWAS because France came in to manipulate. It is the same ECOWAS we see today that is being used, manipulated, destroyed. And they are now the one putting pressure. Let's take a step back. When this thing happened, instead of African Union and ECOWAS working together to see what was the root cause of this, you know, this uh, military takeover, whether in Burkina Faso, in Mali, or in many other countries. What are they doing? They are putting sanctions upon sanctions. The ordinary Malian people are suffering under terrible sanctions, economic sanctions. When you sanction, you're not sanctioning a civic goiter, you're sanctioning the ordinary person. That's the person that filled the street. The person who's a loaf of bread goes from 50 francs to 150 francs because of sanctions. That is a person that suffers the consequences. It's not a semi -quitter. So if the ECOWAS is working for the people of Africa, they should look at how to resolve conflict. Always carrying the hammer, thinking that the hammer is going to be the one sanctioned, is going to solve this. It's not going to solve the problem. Again, it is telling you that ECOWAS is not independent. It is telling you the African Union is not independent. Because if the United Nations can come out and accept lapses, because when we say lapses, Mr. Lewis, just understand that those are diplomatic languages. Lapses simply means we are not part of this. No, we don't know these machineries. That is what it means in ordinary sense. But they are not going to come out and say that because, you know, it's going to cause a diplomatic row. So those are just di diplomatic code languages. In essence, they are saying we do not recognize these machineries. We do not ask for these new missionaries. Therefore, the Ivorians themselves took responsibility in order to, you know, and in order to blindfold people, they said, oh, they were lapses. What lapses? These were missionaries sent to destabilize the junta in Mali. They call it a junta. It's a military junta. That's what it is. But they wanted to destabilize that again with the influence of France. To answer your question, yes, these people or these organizations do not represent the interests of Africans. The interest of Africans is peaceful negotiation. Sanctions is not going to do anything. What do they do? Did they actually sit down to have those negotiations? Or immediately it came out, there was condemnation. They didn't look at the root cause of the problem. They did not understand what was going on. They didn't have a sit down with those military. Those sit down only came afterwards. But the immediate reaction was condemnation and sanctions. That tells you, Mr. Lewis, that these organizations are not independent by themselves. These organizations are teleguided from somewhere, and they are there to you know, foster the interests of somebody as not African interests. Because if you look at what has been happening in the ECOS, whether it's from the ECO issue or from all the decisions that they have been wanting to take, even the regional African free trade zone, those that have been putting headaches and hindrances to the implementation of those policies are those that are having interest somewhere else, not on the African continent. And they will want to implement policies that, at the end of the day, will not, you know, policies that will not be in the interest of Africans, but with the interest of somebody else. As we speak, you know, that's a different topic altogether. We know that the Chinese foreign ambassador, his first visit after being installed is not in China. It's not in Asia. It's not in the United States. It's not even in Russia. It's in Africa. Again, this is a new scramble of Africa. Unfortunately, we have to use this word. But that is the reality.
So everyone want his own share of the cake. China want his own share of the cake. Uh, Russia want his own share of the cake. France want his own share of the cake. But Africans need to wake up. We need to wake up and say there is no more 2.0, 2.0 version of scramble of Africa. We have to come to the table, negotiate as equal partners. Whoever comes with the best deal, transfer of resource, I mean, the technology, education. You know, countries that are phoning war in Africa, we know who they are. Africa should not go into negotiation with countries that are going to be selling arms to Africa. We buy arms, kill ourselves, and then we are in hunger, and they come in now, they want to impose on us. We should be wise. Any country that is how to sell arms to Africa. If I was the one in that position, we look at every country that is going into contracts in Africa. If your contracts are more than 50% military contracts with the rest of Africa, no business with Africa. No. Because those people are not out for the interest of Africa. They are interest of the, I mean, they are out for the interest of those companies that are selling those weapons to Africa. So again, Africa must be wise. We must know what our objectives and our goals are. We know we must know what we want, who we want to work with. As I said from the beginning, Africans don't hate France. Africans don't hate any country, even Russia. What Africans are against is manipulation of our leaders to instill foreign interests on the soil of Africa. That is where the problem is. Thanks very much, uh, equally for that. Now, you just mentioned that you said Africans need to wake up and, uh, you know, making decisions that should favor us. We, it's obvious that uh, independent African countries or African countries cannot uh, by have a good bargaining power considering maybe uh, not having a strong economy or, or other issues taken into consideration. Now, we are supposed to work as regional bodies or work with regional organizations like maybe the ECOWAS and the ECAS and all the rest, but we will see uh, regional organizations like the ECOWAS being undermined by France now. The uh, African Union as well is a toothless bulldog. The ECOWAS is a toothless bulldog. Now, how do we achieve these goals considering that the bodies which we have put in place considering that it can help us make good decisions uh, have been undermined? What else can we do? Mr. Lewis, you know, those regional bodies act on regional interests. Let's make that clear. They do not control the economies of those different countries. They act on regional interests, like monetary policies, you know, intercontinental peace and security issues. But in terms of the economies of those countries, every country has the right, the knife, and the yam to be what they want to be. Let's take examples that we've seen success stories in Africa, Mr. Lewis. Let's take examples. Because if these countries on the continent of Africa could succeed, it means any other country could succeed. Let's see what Mogofili did on the continent of Africa in Tanzania. That man took four years. He took four years to transform the economy of that country. What did he do? Number one, he renegotiated draconian contracts that the, his former leader, his predecessor, went into with Western powers. Contracts that will say, for example, one of the terms of the contract said, I don't remember if it was China, I think it was China, they had to build an airport in Tanzania. And that airport, China was to take control of that airport for 99 years. Imagine that kind of contract. 99 years. He said, this is total nonsense. He said, he either cancels, cancels the contract or these countries come to the negotiating table and they renegotiate this contract. That's the first thing he did. Number two, within the civil service, this man dismissed tens upon tens of thousands of God's workers. You don't need ECOWAS. You don't need CEMAC. You don't need African Union. You don't need anybody to do these policies. So again, I'm giving some of these examples to show that the problem in Africa can be solved if we have leaders that have the guts, that have the fortitude, that have the goodwill to do something for the continent of Africa. Now, 
Most of the president, president in Africa now are following the example of Paul Kagame that says, for every raw material that is produced on the source, on the soil of Africa, it should be transformed to semi-finished product before it leaves the continent of Africa. Mr. Lewis, just this one single policy alone, if every African country was his all his ground and said, we are not going to go into any negotiation with any company, with any continent that is going to exploit our rubber, take it to Europe, reproduce it, sell it back to us at 20 times the cost. We are not going to give our cocoa, sent to Europe, uh, chocolate produced in Europe, sold back to us at 50 times the cost. If, if every African country was to hold its ground, only on those simple terms of negotiation. We heard President Paul Bia, you know, in his recent speech, did say the same thing. But we see these lofty speeches, lofty speeches from African president. But on the ground, they go and sign something else. The same thing that Mr. Paul Bia said not a while ago about the production of iron in Africa should be done. But he has signed accords with Chinese companies and all these companies. That iron is going to be produced in a semi-liquid format, sent to Europe, reproduced as, you know, the iron that we use for construction and so on, and sold back to us at 200% price. So that is the problem we have in the continent of Africa. So whether we have ECOWAS, it's true that ECOWAS need to be functioning, CEMAC need to be functioning, but the rest of Africa, I mean, Africa independent countries have sold themselves into some sort of, I don't know, brainwash to sign contracts, go into negotiation, or against their own interest. Love the ideas on paper, but nothing in concrete. That is the problem that we have in the continent of Africa. I will give you another, another example. Thomas Sankara, he ruled only for four years, I mean, in terms of implementing his policies. We saw in Burkina Faso at that time, the literacy rate, Mr. Lewis, went from 20% to 77%. How did he do it? It wasn't magic. This man implemented policies. He had the goodwill. He had the good faith and implemented policies that were benefiting the common man. Not some oligarch in high power controlling and stealing. In Cameroon, for example, we are talking about the Olympic game. We are talking about COVID game. We are talking about all these People that have embezzled money that even the 20th generation will never spend all that money. Their children, 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 children will never spend all that money. But that is one person embezzling in the continent of Africa. That is, oh, those are some of the problems we have in Africa. African leaders do not have the interest of the people at heart. Western powers only come to manipulate those egoistic selfish people that do not have the interest of the people I've had. They do not come with a barrel of a gun and put it on a head and say, you must sign this contract. You must sign this contract. They don't do that. They only manipulate our selfishness and then that one become our own undoing. That's the problem we have in Africa, Mr. Lewis. Uh, thank you for that, Mr. Elijah. Now let's uh, get back again to uh, the Colonel Simi Goethe's decision to pardon the 49 soldiers. Now, according to the statement, uh, it said the decision is described as an independent decision, which means that uh, the decision is not a fair, it's not uh, made out of maybe pressure. And uh, maybe that's why we have the decision here. It said the move is an independent decision symbolizing the president's commitment to good governance and, pre and preserving f and uh, fraternal relations with countries in the region, particularly Iricos. And of course, uh, let's look at this aspect of independent decision. This means uh, decision was not f uh, made out of pressure. What do we learn from Asimi Goethe considering is 2020 coming into power and everything he has achieved for his country thus far. What that tells me, Mr. Lewis, is that if a military, if a military man is going to be the one making independent decision, decisions without the eyesight world, it seems to tell me that maybe, you know, I made mention, you know, like a joke to somebody that maybe we need the military juntas in Africa, but you know, that might be a joke, but the reality yeah. seems to suggest that we yeah. need some kind of leadership in Africa because if we have a military leader that is able to take independent decisions without the influence of France, without the influence of the United States, without the influence of uh, African Union, without the influence of anybody, he took that decision by himself. It seems to suggest that the military leadership is 
doing something that civilian leaders are not able to do. What a tragedy on the continent of Africa that we have a military leader that is doing things that civilians, elected leaders, are not able to do, Mr. Lewis. Take, for example, I don't know if it was Burkina Faso, recently, mm. uh, Colonel um, Ibrahim Traore, he said a communique. He said he is giving 48 hours for anybody that's stolen money from the government treasury, anybody that's having government car, anybody that, you know, he was giving uh, uh, amnesty that everybody that has stolen anything from the government treasury should return that money to the government treasury within 48 hours, otherwise it's going to fail a jail term. It will be shocking for Africans to find out that. The, some that I read, they said 48.1 billion was returned to the state treasury within 48 hours. That is the continent in which you find ourselves. That if it takes a military leader an ultimatum for what has been stolen from the state treasury to be returned, it seems to suggest that we need a different kind of leadership in Africa. Again, I'm not suggesting here that we need military junctures all over Africa, but it seems to suggest that the leadership we have in Africa, all over Africa, a lot of the 90%, if I can put a figure, a number on it, do not or cannot rule Africans. That's what it, that's what it suggests to me. Because here is a man who has taken an independent decision to see that there's peace with his neighbors, even though he had the right, because these were missionaries. From every indication and every investigation, these were missionaries that were sent to stabilize this country. But for the good of the sub-regional region, this man has decided to take a decision and say, I am making a decision to free these people because I want peace with my neighbors. I want brotherliness with my neighbors. I don't want conflict with Ivory Coast and all whatnot. Something that would not even have been the case if we had a civilian leader. Why? I say so because these civilian leaders have strings attached to them. They do not act according to their will. A lot of them are trying to implement Western policies, policies that are coming from somewhere else, interests that are coming from somewhere else. But having a, a, a military leader that is taking an independent decision without any strings attached, nobody's pushing him to do, make that, take that decision, suggest to me, Mr. Lewis, Africa needs a different kind of leadership. Is it military junta? I cannot tell you. But civilian or democracy that we currently have in Africa, the kind of democracy we currently have in Africa, seem not to be working for the good of Africans. And if exactly just this pushes me to, to wonder if exactly democracy, just like you've said, being a Western world culture, if, it's, if it is working for Africa. And considering this uh, point, this moment where Africa basically has to battle against new colonialism and the West equally using democracy to, it's like the West is using, taking advantage of democracy to try to undermine uh, African institutions. Now, just like you've said, do we still rely on the democracy, not taking into consideration that maybe military rule is what we need, but what else can we do to achieve some of these uh, goals which are not easily being achieved with uh, democratic or, uh, leaders? We see leaders who are democratically elected, but they don't have the power, they don't have that independent uh, uh, power to make some certain decisions, just like we've seen in Mali recently, being able to cut ties with France, and we've seen in Burkina Faso, and we're seeing uh, this being achieved just in a very short while. Now, what do we do, Mr. Elijah Inoko? You are a researcher with, uh, with Leeds University on African Development. Should we continue to rely on uh, democracy, which, of course, is not working, and we realize that there's much that we need to achieve, and time is not on our side, and we are in battle with the West in trying to, you know, uh, be independent and being say, so and makes independent decisions to benefit Africans. What do we do? Let me shock your viewers, Mr. Lewis. Let me shock people. I am not against any military junta in Africa. What I'm against is the shedding of blood. If we have a leader that is able to turn Africa around, if we have a leader it could be a despot, but we have a benevolent despot that is able to turn the situation in Africa around. I do not care what the West is saying about democracy here, democracy here. 
Thomas Sankara was a military leader that took over power. I don't remember if Amos blood was shed or not, but when he took power, we saw what that man did. Then we have a civilian leader, a, a elected leader, like Mugufuli, that took power. We saw what he did. Then we have a Rwanda and a Paul Kagame. We are seeing what he's doing. So we have a mix of military leaders and civilian leaders that are doing well. What am I trying to drive home here? If we have leaders that have the interests of Africans at heart, that are able to demonstrate to the African people that we can compete on the global scene without taking orders from France, without taking orders from the United States, without taking orders from Russia, without taking orders from whosoever, and we're able to stand our ground, let Africa give that leader the time to demonstrate themselves. That is why I, for one, I am against all the pressure that has been brought up on Paul Kagame and say he's been there for 25 years, he should vacate. Yes, we need him to open up the economy to all opposition and let there be free and fair elections. But that kind of Western pressure that is being put on him to vacate power and chaos, chaos is going to be instilled in that country. I am not for that kind of democracy. We saw in in Libya, it is true that Gaddafi has his own problems with his people. But if I ask every African, would you rather accept the I mean, uh, the Libya in the time of Gaddafi where there was peace, where everybody was sent to school for free, where everybody had gas, everybody had minimum salary, where there was, you know, the, the, the standard of living in, in Libya at that time was commendable. Libya was dead. Free. There was no debt. There were no foreign debt from any country. Yet, we do accept that there were some issues in terms of the way he was ruling, but would you rather prefer that Libya or the chaos we see in Libya today? I would take the first. Any time, any day, any hour. Because people without peace cannot talk about democracy. The chaos we see in, 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 in Libya today, that is not democracy. The chaos we see in Central Africa region today that France is trying to in institute, especially in Central African Republic, that is not democracy. That's not what Africans need. Democracy at the battle of the gun, where Africans are going to be killing themselves because somebody's interest somewhere else is, you know, is being instituted, trying to be instituted. That is not the kind of democracy that I'm for. I am for democracy that represents the interests of the people it doesn't matter the route it's going to take. As long as the people are comfortable, see what is happening in, in uh, Equatorial Guinea. Obian Gema has been there for I don't know how long. But we see the relative stability in that country. Are uh, the people complaining? That's a different thing altogether. But we see Western powers are putting pressure on Obian Gemba. And when they put pressure, what is going to happen? They are going to instill their own puppet leader over there. And before you know it, Guns will start following. Before you know it, chaos will start following. Before you know it, war will follow. And before you know it, the country will be in shambles. So the question that comes to us in Africa is, would you rather have stability with some sort of development while they are trying to institute, you know, institutions that are going to guarantee free and fair elections? Or would you rather bring guns, shoot somebody, kill people, institute chaos, that you're trying to institute democracy, I say I will take the latter over the former, former any day, any time in Africa because Africa would develop faster through that means than the, trying to institute democracy through the battle of the gun because that's what the West is trying to do. That's what they've tried to do. They have tried it elsewhere. They have tried it in Afghanistan. It doesn't work. They have tried it in 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 Iraq. It's not working. They are trying to try it in Africa. You cannot institute democracy at the battle of the gun. No, no, no. I will never support that in Africa. A message now to what is that message to Africans? Many who still look at look at democracy like uh, the the ultimate. They believe that maybe the leaders should uh, leave power maybe after the term expires but definitely we're looking at those who are able to deliver we're looking at those who are able to meet up with the expectations and those who are able to 
you know, fight the battle that Africa is fighting at this moment. What do you think should be that message to Africans who are still believing democracy? Mr. Lewis, you made a very key statement, and the word that you used there, which is very critical, which, which I want to highlight, is leaders that can deliver. It's not just any Tom, Dick, and Harry that's going to be in power for centuries and is not delivering. Deliver. Leaders that can deliver. That's a key word. If a leader is able to deliver, Mr. Lewis, that is where the essence is. Because we're not talking about people who are there for donkeys of years and the economy is going down the drain, and then we just say, oh, because he's been there, you know, we cannot do this or that. No. Leaders that are able to deliver. As long as this man is able to deliver, Mr. Lewis, let him deliver for Africa. In the medieval ages, we saw our chiefs, our chief tenancy system that was delivering for the people. We saw representative democracy. We saw quarter heads. We saw people gather together and you know, come up with a plan for the development of our regions, our sectors, our villages, and so on. That is African democracy at work. And it had work, and it has always worked. If the local leaders at the local level, the power to institute change, and people will see it and they will love it, that kind of democracy has existed before. Even though Africa did not call it democracy, the West is trying to make us if we never knew democracy. That was democracy. In your village, you had the chief. You had the quarter head. Every quarter had a representative. They met in the chief, at the chief palace. They talked about, you know, how are they going to develop the village. Every quarter would come up with its own, you know, ideas of what they're going to do and what are their own challenges. And they would gather together and they would look for ways to raise funds and develop their village. That is the representative democracy that has worked in Africa. On that little organic level, it can be expanded to a regional level divisional level, provincial level, and therefore national level. So democracy has worked in Africa, but in a different way. So let the West not come and lecture us and say we have not been democratic, and then they want to institute their own democracy through the power of the gun, and then we are killing ourselves, and there's chaos all over the place. I do not accept or condone that kind of democracy. Never. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Elijah Inoku. And uh, reading some of the comments we have here on Facebook, we have Edward uh, Ngamin. He say, you are correct, my brother. Mali representatives uh, should watch out with Alassane Ouattara because he wants to remain Ivory Coast president. He is ready to do whatever the West will ask him to do. That's a comment someone leaves on our Facebook page, Mr. Elijah. He is very right. He is very right. This is somebody who came to power. In, you know, the first thing you said is, oh, there's no need for African leaders to sit tight. But we saw what he did. He immediately came to power, he changed the constitution. And he now is ruling for the third term. And when people ask him about what he said from before, you know, he manipulated his way. He's now changing language and become philosophical or whatnot. That is just France. Ladies and gentlemen, that is France manipulating. Because France saw the daylight. Pan-Africanism in Ivory Coast was rising so high. And France saw this handwriting on the wall that the next leader that was going to take over from him was going to be somebody like Laurent Gbagbo, who had those anti-French and anti-colonialism you know, tendencies. France saw the handwriting. He said, guy, we cannot let you go. You have to stay there. That is the role that Alassane Drama Ouattara is playing in Ivory Coast. He's not representing the interests of Ivorian. He is representing French interests in that country. Uh, Mr. Elijah, definitely we want to appreciate those of you who are watching us. We have uh, lawyer Inotep. You say you're right. Thanks very much. We saw your comments. We have cleared up enough. We equally saw your comments. We have other uh, comments as well. We uh, saw those of you who are watching us equally on Facebook live page. Thank you very much. And uh, we have Eva Njok equally. We saw your comments. We have uh, Lasana Dram. We equally saw your comments. Thank you very much, those of you who were watching us this afternoon. Uh, Mr. Elijah, any last comments before we wrap up this edition for today? My last comment is to um, Asimi Goiter. Watch your back. That's my last comment. Watch yeah. your back. I do not know the terms of that deal because I know the Togolese president was involved and some of the people were involved. And you finally said you acted out of your own accord. But whatever accord you went in with, watch your back because we have known over the years that the poster child of 
Transafrique in Africa, and the epicenter of Transafrique in Africa right now is Ivory Coast, represented by Alassane Draman Wachara. I hope he changes. But so far, what we see, everything France is doing, whether the destabilization of the rest of uh, uh, French-speaking Africa, the epicenter of it is in Ivory Coast as we speak. So my message to uh, uh, Sibi Goetia is, whatever accord you went into with uh, Alassane Ouattara, watch your back. And please work for the benefit of the people of Mali. And I'm thinking that people will give you the support. I believe it. I've seen it. I've seen the demonstration on the street. I've seen young people come out and say, we want to give our leader the opportunity to show what he's made out of. And with that support, work for the interests of your people. And history will remember you for good. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. You still remember him for good. Thanks very much, equally, uh, Mr. Elijah Enroku. Watch your back is a message to uh, President Colonel Simi Goitzer. Desperate France, of course, is not giving up. That's the reason why he should watch his back. Definitely, Africans are watching him too, and we're here each time to enlighten Africans, and we appreciate your comments and your contribution this afternoon, Mr. Elijah Enroku, researcher with Lakes University on African Development. We thank you very much for being there. Thank you, Koli. Those of you who are watching us uh, this afternoon, we appreciate you for always tuning in to your Pan-African Television Afric Media. Uh, much appreciation, equally to our technicians this afternoon. Asimi Goita, Mali's president, has pardoned 49 soldiers from neighboring Ivory Coast who were arrested in July and accused of being mercenaries. And according to a communique, uh, Colonel Abdullah Maiga, the Malian government spokesperson, said in a statement, a pardon granted by Mali's president, Asimi Goita, demonstrates once again his commitment to peace, dialogue, pan-Africanism, and the preservation of fraternal and secular relations with regional countries, in particular those between Mali and Ivory Coast. That was our topic of discussion uh, today. We keep a close look on the developments between Mali and Ivory Coast diplomatic relations, and of course, more happenings regarding Africa. That's why we're here each time to enlighten, to equally give you opportunity to contribute and make uh, your voices also heard. On to tomorrow again. Thanks for being there. More programs are yours on Africa Media. Stay with us. Bye-bye for now.